In the year 1800, the British suddenly and accidentally found themselves in charge of Malta, and then it uh, fell to them to defend the place, which turned out to be more complicated than you might imagine. And that's what I'm going to be talking about in this video, which has been sponsored by The Great Courses Plus. But we'll get to them in due course. Now, uh, Malta is, is small. It's a nation-state. It's a complete nation-state. It's got its own uh, parliament. It's got its own language. Um, but it is, as I said, small. Now, I could tell you that the main island of Malta is 17 miles long by seven and a half miles wide, but perhaps it's difficult for you to, to, to you know, conceptualize that in your head. But uh, what, what if I showed you this map of the main island of Malta and, in scale with it, the International Airport, which is, which is that. Yes. And it's quite a modest international. And this isn't Heathrow. This isn't a major hub. Uh, this is just bringing in holiday makers and the like. Uh, so that's quite a modest sized airport. And yeah, to scale with the island, there you go. That's how small Malta is. Um, but the thing is that it's, it, you know, it has a population. It has farms and the like, and people want to you know, work on their farms and live normal lives. So you can't just turn the entire place into a great big fort. In fact, even though it's small, it's not small enough for that. Uh, turning the whole place into a fort would have been ruinously expensive for the British and was quite unfeasible. Um, so, yeah, it's very small, but it's not small enough to be really easy to defend. There are loads of places uh, where the enemy might land an army and, and, and threaten to march across and, and, and conquer you. So, what do you do? Well, um, Having decided that it was the wrong size, they couldn't station an army there, for instance. They, 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 you, if, you, if you want to station an army on an island as big, say, as Sicily, then yeah, you might do that. And that would be a, a great central base for you to operate from in the Mediterranean. If you wanted to invade somewhere else, you, you'd have an army ready to go in Sicily, and it's ready to go in any direction. And having an island in, in the, the centre of the Mediterranean is really strategically useful. Uh, I know this uh, partly because um, in my 20s I designed a, a war game campaign system uh, that was set in the Mediterranean around the time of the Punic Wars, uh, and it was the whole of the Mediterranean, and every player who played this game very quickly realised, oh, Sicily's important, isn't it? And indeed, history has borne this out. An awful lot of people trying to take over that part of the world of trying to take over Sicily. Um, and Malta is smack bang in the centre of the Mediterranean. You can't get much more centre central than, than Malta, but you can get a lot larger. So it's not really big enough to keep an army on. I mean, they'd all be cheek by jowl, all bored as hell, because there'd be, you know, most of the time there'd be no enemy to fight or anything to do, really, and they'd, they'd, they'd all be catching diseases and giggling and costing the exchequer of Britain an absolute fortune, and you'd have to bring all the supplies in to feed them, and then almost everybody on the island would be in the British Army. No, it, it wasn't feasible to have an army there. It was just going to be a regiment or two, perhaps, defending the, the islands, in which case they'd need good fortifications, but you can't fortify the whole island. It's just too big for that, and besides, Though there were many schemes for how to fortify the island, almost all of them were, were ditched on the grounds of it would be far too expensive. But they did know it was really important to hang on to this. And as the um, 19th century progressed, um, the Victorian British uh, realised more and more, oh, this is going to be really important because this is going to be the route to India. Not only is it strategic for control of the Mediterranean, but it's the route to India. Now, you may say, well, wait, hang on, it wasn't until uh, 1869 that the Suez Canal opened. Uh, true, but the idea of a route to India through, uh, through that sort of uh, part of the world was a very old one. The ancient Egyptians, in fact, had cut canals uh, linking lakes and uh, lakes to uh, the sea and then lakes to uh, arms of the, the Nile Delta. So they could actually get ships from one side uh, of, of the world to the other, if you like, over the hump of, of Africa. Um, and the Ptolemies had to go at uh, building uh, canals as well. And uh, then uh, late, the Venetians were very keen to open up a route to India. They, they, they never actually got around to, to trying. The Ottomans gave it a try. They gave up. Uh, Napoleon, in fact, had a, a plan as well to, um, to build a canal through that part of the world. And uh, the British sent out surveyors quite early on. And in 1830, um, a load of surveyors reported to Parliament uh, that it was perfectly feasible. They, they'd surveyed the, the sea levels either side. And yep, yep, they were compatible. Um, there was this fear that if you cut the Suez Canal that the Mediterranean would flood uh, because the, it was thought by some that the the, uh, the Indian Ocean was a fair bit higher, but it's not. Uh, anyway, um, so they were reporting uh, in 1830, yep, yep, we can go ahead now. And it wasn't admittedly until 1869. It took longer than they, they were hoping. But 
they knew it was coming, the route to India was coming, and so Malta was going to be really important. So yeah, a lot of other people would then try to take it off them. So you had to fortify it against the, the, the French, obviously, and the, the, the Russians and, and the, the, the Turks and various other people who might try to uh, wrest Malta from the British grasp. Now, uh, it was in 1879 uh, that, no, 18, 1878, beg your pardon, uh, that uh, Napoleon decided that he was going to prove not just to his own countrymen, because he'd pretty much already done that, but to the rest of the world that he was just about as evil as it is, as it is possible for a human to be. Um, one could say, looking, uh, looking at later history, that possibly Chairman Mao of China was even more evil than Napoleon, but it's, it's, it's a, a close race. Um, and uh, he decided, right, I'm going to conquer the world, and uh, I'll start by invading Egypt. Um, and he used as a stepping stone on his way to Egypt, Malta. And Malta fell almost immediately. The, the Maltese didn't put up any uh, serious resistance. Uh, and uh, Napoleon uh, just spent all of six days looting the place very thoroughly um, and say, I am your new benign ruler. I have, have brought enlightenment and the French Revolution to you and now hand over all your valuables now or else. Um, so, uh, yeah, he didn't exactly endear himself to the Maltese. And after a while, the Maltese rebelled and uh, asked the British to, um, to intervene. And the British did. And then uh, they said, you know what? We don't particularly want to be ruled by the Knights of St. John, uh, which is uh, what was, uh, that was our regime before, because, yeah, they weren't perfect, actually. We think you'd be much better. Please stay. Please stay. And, of course, then they would have the protection of the British. And the British at first thought, oh, no, this is not the plan at all. But, oh, no, actually... Yeah, maybe this would be the centre of, center of uh, Mediterranean, pretty good. Suez Canal maybe one day, good. Yeah, all right, yeah, oh, okay, we'll do it. But how? Uh, there was quite a problem. Um, now, I, I, I think what I shall do is I shall divide the island into three. Uh, essentially, you've got uh, Marshishlock and Valletta, the, the ports in the, in, the, in the south and east, uh, and then you've got the, the cliffs along the southwest of the island, then you've got the north. Now. And Valletta, which is a peninsula flanked either side by just two magnificent, near perfect natural harbours. They just say, oh, come on, let's have a huge fleet here. Come on, just look at us. We're just brilliant harbours. You've got to use us. Um, that was already quite well fortified, as I say, by the various uh, uh, knights of old. But um, the British weren't too worried about that because they could install the latest guns and uh, at, uh, particularly at the two forts of Cambridge and Rinella, they brought in the latest 100 ton Armstrong guns that fired a one ton shell to the horizon with tremendous accuracy and spelt death to any enemy ship uh, that dared show, show up uh, with any sort of hostile intent. And uh, none ever did. So the guns worked. I won't talk for ages about the, the biggest guns in the world that the Victorians installed at those two forts because I made a video all about them some while ago and you could just watch that instead. Uh, the, but the point is that, uh, as this map shows, um, the Ark of Fire had, had approaches to Vletta Harbour pretty much covered. Uh, so they were, they, were, they were confident that the, the Johnny Foreigner wouldn't approach from that direction. Master Schlock, you'll see in the, in the, in the south, uh, which is where Napoleon landed, uh, that also had pretty major batteries defending on it, uh, defending it, not as spectacular but they still felt that the job was done. Actually I've got some footage of Master Schlock so let's have a look at that. So you can see it's quite pretty. It's not all just jolly little boats though, there are also some large industrial bits. Uh, Master Schlock is a major port with container ships coming in all the time. There is a Carthaginian a habit of putting eyes on the front of boats to protect them that still survives. Ah, they were getting ready for something. I didn't know what at the time, but was soon to find out. They're very proud of their British heritage, and why not? Oh, oh, Mr. Whippy! Can, can we, can we? Oh, shh, it's me. This is Master Schlock. Yes, the uh, X is pronounced like a sh. And uh, it's an historic place, as well as quite pretty, because loads of things happened here. In 1565, this is where the Turks landed when they were invading. And in 1798, when Napoleon turned up, Again, it was here. And yeah, Napoleon only spent six days in Malta. And in that time, I think he must have been very busy looting and doing not a lot else because uh, he filled up his ship, uh, L'Orient, um, and he was just groaning with, with gold and silver and paintings and all sorts of looted stuff. Uh, I, I'm very glad to be able to say, though, that uh, the French didn't get away with it. No, because the British sank the ship and all the treasure went to the bottom of the sea. So, uh, hooray, the French didn't get away with it. Sorry, Malta. Anyway. 
Um, uh, he left behind 4,000 Frenchmen to garrison Malta, and that uh, turned out to be not quite enough. Uh, because uh, the Maltese, who hadn't actually resisted the invasion in the first place, decided that uh, the French were so despicable that they would rebel. And they did, and they, uh, they, wa they hold them up in Valletta. And then they sent a word to the British saying, excuse me, can you just deal with these Frenchmen? Uh, could you enforce a naval blockade or something like that? And uh, the British, of course, ever happy to oblige stuffing the French, uh, did precisely that. And uh, in September 1800, the French uh, surrendered, and then the British found themselves in possession of Malta, which wasn't actually the plan at all. I mean, the plan was to stuff the French. That was the easy part of the plan. But then we've got Malta now. Is that is that good? We've got Malta. Do we want... I, they weren't entirely sure. Um, another thing that was quite historic here, uh, it was in 1989 that a summit happened here between Presidents Mikhail Gorbachev and George Bush Sr. Uh, because, you know, what with the collapse of the Soviet Union and everything, uh, or at least communism within it, uh, they decided to end the Cold War, uh, which was nice. making this noise for about four minutes now. Seems like ten. Ooh, no, that's not a good sign. Mm. Now there's one rather splendid sight that I'm afraid we're missing today. You see, in the 1930s, British Imperial Airways used the calm waters of Master Schlock here for its pioneering international air service. Yes, huge flying boats, four engines, short C-class jobs would land in the waters here. Little boats would go out to them, and then important passengers could transfer, and then boom, others would fly off to all corners of the empire. Must have been quite a sight. That's a shop of some sort. Oh no, that, that's an advert for batteries that was painted onto sheet steel and, and, and it's faded in the sun. I'm sitting here just trying to write postcards and it's difficult enough to do that. Uh, it's not, as you can tell, ideal uh, conditions for doing pieces to camera. Catholicism has broken out on all sides. Yes, peace does not reign here at Master Schlock because today is Rosary Day. The day in which they ring the bells tunelessly for about two hours now and nuns abound. Right, so the next part of the island they had to defend uh, were the Dingley Cliffs, which uh, run up the left-hand side, run up the sort of southwestern coast of the island. Um, now, I was a little bit worried that I was going to pronounce that incorrectly because uh, the Maltese place names are generally derived from Arabic, and I don't know how to say it. Um, but it turns out, no, it's just Dingley because they're named after Sir Thomas Dingley, who was an English knight of uh, St. John, uh, one of the knights of Malta from the olden days, who happened to be a big land uh, owner in the area, and he got the cliffs named after him. So that's easy. Uh, uh, anyway, as this uh, geological relief map of the island shows, it's quite sort of, sort of cliffy along that uh, part of the, the, the island. Um, I've got some footage of there as well, so let's have a look at that. So there's the sea to the south and west and a big slope with cliffs in places and, well, even the flattest bits are not at all flat and I wouldn't want to have to fight my way up that. And that's a good place to put one of those. It might look like a mosque, but no, it's a radar station. It's vital under these circumstances to have a good chin strap on your hat. So the British knew that they would have to defend the Dingley Cliffs a bit, but they wouldn't have to go to a huge amount of trouble. A few artillery batteries, some searchlights, patrols, ah, they'd be fine. Because it is very difficult to land a fleet on a cliff. So that leaves the north. And there's really quite a lot of the north, and there are quite a few places that you might land, say, an invading army, which was a bit of a worry. Uh, let's, have a, let's have a look at the, uh, the north, shall we? So, photographed from the plane, uh, you can see these deep 
inlets with sheltered coves and gentle beaches. Loads of places in the north to land an army. Look, there's a really good one there, and you can see just in the next... Co and it just goes on for mile after mile of coastline. So to fortify all that lot would take staggering and quite unfeasibly large and very expensive resources. So that was a very major worry for the British. So much north, how do you fortify it? They came up, though, with a solution, uh, and a rather ingenious one, which perhaps only the British could have come up with. What was that? Well, you'll just have to wait a little bit longer, I'm afraid, because it's advert break time. <laughs> My kind sponsor is The Great Courses Plus, possibly my favourite sponsor. Now, if you don't know what The Great Courses Plus is, I'll tell you, because, well, it's the logical thing to do, and only polite. It's a gigantic website on which you'll find thousands upon thousands of lectures by distinguished professors from august universities, mainly from the eastern United States, on all sorts of topics. So there's bound to be something there that you're interested in, and you can take advantage if you go to uh, thegreatcoursesplus.com stroke, yes, I said stroke, I'm British, Lindy Beige, um, and because there's a free trial offer on, and during that free trial period, you can just go wild, go roaming around the site at will, watching as much as you like on all sorts of, as I say, topics of ac academic interest. And um, um, But they're not just fuddy-duddy old old types. Oh no, 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 they're, they're cyber savvy. They're down with the young folk, and I know this because they've now uh, launched all sorts of uh, social media thingy bobbies, and you can take advantage of those because you know what it's like, don't you? You go on your social media and, uh, oh, there's something about kittens, and then maybe there's a joke that's mildly funny about uh, roleplay gaming or something, and then uh, someone is expressing some view that you disagree with on politics, and, and then possibly you'll see someone uh, saying something you agree with about politics. Uh, but then you might I see know. something by The Great Courses Plus. Knowledge. And you'll find links to all the various social media thingamabobbies in, in the description of this video. Uh, now, um, one of the uh, new lecture courses that they've added, they're adding new ones all the time, is on a topic which I, I'm rather interested in, game theory. You see, I did game theory um, uh, in archaeology, a look at the potential. That was the title of my uh, dissertation for my of my archaeology degree. Um, apparently it was the only one of the many dissertations that there was uh, any discussion about what mark it should get. Uh, some of the staff thought it should get the top mark and some of the staff thought it should re get the bottom mark and uh, in the end I got a sort of a middling mark. But I'm sure that was entirely fair and I'm not bitter. Anyway, uh, I was looking at the potential in archaeology, but um, uh, this comes under the economics department, it seems, uh, of the Great Courses Plus, because it's called Understanding Economics, colon, Game Theory. Now, it's true that economists did actually come up with this uh, mathematical way of analysing behaviour, um, but really they, they're the ones who didn't run with it, uh, not anything like as much as the behavioural and evolutionary biologists who realised, oh, game theory, this is such a useful tool for us, and, and, and they went wild with it. And uh, uh, of course game theory um, then uh, came back to me when I then went on to study uh, evolutionary psychology, and oh, I realise I'm going rather off topic. Anyway, the point is that there, there's this uh, a lecture course that you can go and see, and there, there you go, there's the chap, and he, he's, he's lecturing away now. He's, he's made some uh, bold decisions here. He's gone, he's gone, for instance, no jacket, no tweed jacket. He's, he's, it, it, it's just a show of confidence and how you know, down he is with the young folk. And actually, to be honest, I think he carries it off, and he's got the serious professorial uh, glasses there, you'll notice. Um, I think he could have been bolder with the hair, though. Yes, it's reasonably unkempt, uh, and so therefore scholarly, but I, there's still quite a lot of room between, between that and, and you know, looking like a lunatic. And, and you know, I, I think he could have pushed it just that little bit more, which would have been an even greater, I feel, show of confidence. Um, as for his, his cradles, well, he doesn't use them. Uh, no, no, he's not a cradleist at all. Um, he's a parallel waving guy, and uh, though he does nothing other than parallel waving guy, to be fair, he does take parallel waving to new heights, so um, I think he'll be fine. So there you go, the great course is plus. Why not give it a go? Welcome back. Now, why would they be so worried about an army landing? I mean, surely the thing to do is you use your, your, your guns and all the rest of it to keep the invaders at a distance, with, with, with blasting at them with the big cannons and bang and all the rest of it, like those big cannons at Ranella and, and Cambridge. Well, uh, it's because that's not the way it's done. You see, 
almost no one in history attacked a harbour from the sea with the intention of taking it and holding it. Yes, you probably heard of loads and loads of raids, uh, the singeing of the, this, the King of Spain's beard, for instance, where you send fire ships in to burn a fleet uh, and then run away laughing, uh, or you uh, perhaps invent the aircraft and drop bombs, or you do a commando raid or whatever. But actually an, ar an army attacking a well-fortified and garrisoned uh, and stoutly uh, defended harbour with the intention of taking it? It's almost impossible. And very few people ever tried it, and very, very few ever succeeded. You might say, oh, wait a minute, uh, uh, didn't the Romans uh, attack Syracuse and take it uh, fr from the sea? Ah, uh, ah, uh, and then someone else might say, oh, no, wait a minute, no, 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 because Archimedes uh, was the scientist with all these gadgets defending Syracuse, and, and he, he defeated the Romans. This is wrong in, in two ways. Uh, one, uh, Archimedes did not defeat the Romans. Yes, he delayed uh, their success, uh, but the Romans did actually eventually conquer Syracuse and, and they killed Archimedes. Um, and two, um, yes, they did attack from the sea, but they failed, partly, well, largely you might say because of Archimedes, but they attacked from the sea and failed. The successful attack was from the land against Syracuse. Um, and this is the way you normally do it. Oh, a much better example. Sorry, Pompey. Right, so... Um, uh, Pompey, as in you know, Pompey and Caesar. Uh, if you've watched the, the the HBO series, this guy, okay, Pompey, Pompey the Great, he was known. Um, uh, you, possibly you didn't know that he uh, fought an amazing campaign against the pirates of the Mediterranean, and these were a serious threat to Rome. Uh, what with all the Roman civil wars and, and, and the like, um, and other wars around the Mediterranean, there were a lot of desperados who could uh, starve or be killed or disappear into the Mediterranean, become pirates. And I dare say they quite like keeping you know, pet monkeys and, and, and birds and so forth, and everyone likes doing the accent. So they thought, right, we'll become pirates. But it wasn't just a few of them. It was, this was a, a major pirate nation almost. It was something like 400 little coastal towns dotted all the way around the Mediterranean. And they were getting quite coordinated and organized as well as numerous and a serious threat even to a, a power as great as Rome. In fact, in uh, 68, I think it was, uh, BC, uh, they, they were so audacious, they actually attacked a Roman fleet in Ostia, the main port of Rome. So you can imagine the Romans were thinking, well, we, we can't have this. Uh, and what really brought things to a head was that the Romans were actually getting pretty short of, uh, of food. The famine was feared because it was getting more and more difficult to ship in uh, food from around the empire or, or just from other trading nations uh, because of these, the, these really effective pirates. Um, uh, so uh, they sent out... Uh, actually, before Pompey, they sent out two other um, uh, commanders to take on the pirates, and both these uh, commanders went out there and came back and were granted a massive triumph in Rome because, hooray, the pirates were defeated. They weren't defeated. Uh, because what you do is you, you, you sail to where you think there are some pirates, you catch a few of them, and all the others just, just melt away into other bits of the Mediterranean, wait there for a bit for you to go away, and then they come back. Yeah, but Pompey... Pompey was voted extra... There's quite a lot of politics. Never mind. One way or another, he ended up being voted absolutely extraordinarily vast powers that, that really worried a lot of other Romans. Um, at this point, Julius Caesar was actually on his side supporting him, sort of. Um, anyway, uh, they voted him uh, all sorts of rights to levy taxes and raise money and raise armies. He could have almost as much money as he needed, as, as he liked, and troops as he liked. Uh, and they gave him... For three years, three years, total control of the whole of the Mediterranean, including 50 miles inland. I don't know why they gave him quite so much inland uh, uh, power, but they did. 50 miles, that's a hell of a distance, in from the coast all the way around the Mediterranean. Okay, that shall be, that shall be your domain for three years, and you can use this, this, this power that we are granting you to finally rid the Mediterranean, and therefore also roam of the pirate menace. Um, uh, okay, so we had three years, and uh, he he put together a force of uh, it was like a hundred and it was one hundred twenty-five thousand men, I think, about five thousand cavalry. Um, 
and hundreds of ships, can't remember how many, and uh, he divided the Mediterranean up into 13 or 15 segments and said, right, you, 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 not you, 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 seriously not, you and you, you're all prefects and uh, you all uh, get command of one of these sea areas and we'll all coordinate. So you might chase a load of pirates from there into this guy's trap and, and so we'll catch a load that way. And he very methodically went round the Mediterranean and uh, got them all. Got, he, he rid uh, Rome of the pirate menace. And um, how long did they take him? He was given three years. He did it in 89 days. And he came in well under budget as well. Uh, so uh, a lot of people were pretty impressed. And so they should have been. Um, so it was just organization. But anyway, why am I saying? Oh, yeah, the point is that he wasn't attacking harbors from the sea. Because um, that's that's a, a daft way of doing it. If you want to catch fleeing pirates, then you can you can hang back with your fleet away from the, the harbour, and then you land your troops maybe forty miles away and march overland. So if you've landed say thirty thousand troops and and uh, a load of pirates in their little fort on the coast, thinking ha ha, we say, oh, there are there are, there are thirty thousand. Yeah, 30,000 Romans coming to us. Uh, right, so what are your options? They are flee. So if you flee out of the fort onto the land, but that's not very good. You've just gone out of your own defences, so you've just made yourself more vulnerable. Uh, or you could die, or, or, or you could surrender. That's much better. And uh, Pompey, at least, well, did have the good sense to be lenient. Uh, and so loads of people were willing to uh, surrender to him, and he ended up uh, not killing. Okay, he killed some, but he didn't. He didn't kill many of them, and uh, he was he was resettling them in in little colonies around the Mediterranean. So you just go there and just don't be pirates. Okay, just don't be pirates. Be nice, and then I won't kill you all. And uh, so yes, they, so if you give people good terms, they'll start surrendering to you. And yes, the pirate menace was ended, and he he did it by. Uh, catching pirates at sea, of course, to some degree, but also attacking from the land. Um, so this is why uh, the, the, the British were so flipping worried, because Malta was big enough for quite a big army to land uh, and conquer the, conquer, the, uh, conquer the island. You couldn't have a permanently stationed army there, but yeah, if you just wanted to conquer the island, it was doable. So um, with all those uh, landing places in the north, what could they do? Right, well, they surveyed the land, had lots of, of, of cups of tea and discussions, and they decided that the thing to do was let them land. Yeah, let them. Just Let's just not really fortify the north. Instead, we'll uh, create a line of fortifications uh, that's today called the Victoria Lines, uh, just for historical clarification. It was only actually called the Victoria Lines in 1897, so quite a bit later than them. Uh, the, 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 the early days, uh, which was the, the occasion of Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee. So in honour of, of the good Queen, they named yet another thing after her. Uh, but anyone call, everyone calls it the Victoria Lines today. So, so they created the Victoria Lines. So these were uh, really just one Victoria Line, a defensive line across a natural ridge uh, about seven and a half miles long across the width of the island. Um, but it's not in the far north, it's, it's a fair bit down the island. Um, and to the north you've got all those coves and quite a bit of flat land, and I've got footage of that, so let's have a look at that. I'm on the outskirts of Gargur. Normally GH is silent in Maltese, but for some reason it's Gargur and not Aur. Anyway, um, these are the Victoria Lines. You can see a defensive parapet coming around that promontory there and running along the top of the steep slope. Coming around towards us again, there's a blockhouse there. Yes, the parapet is quite small. It was only about five feet uh, along the, most of its length, uh, but the slope beneath it, it was pretty steep and very inconvenient for anyone trying to come up it whilst having grenades dropped on him. And there you see beneath the broad sunlit downlands. Okay. One frustration on this trip has been how phenomenally noisy Malta is. I thought possibly I could do some pieces of the camera here, but there's someone riding a motorcycle down there, round and round, aimlessly in circles, and he has possibly the noisiest motor known to man. There's someone else letting off fireworks and someone else hammering something, and, and they're, they're most of a mile away, and still it's difficult to hear myself above them. 
Much to the disappointment of many Maltese hoping for employment making fortifications, the British weren't in a hurry to build much upon arrival. Warfare technology hadn't changed a lot, so the existing fortifications were pretty good, and Britain was so dominant as a power that she didn't have much to fear here. Guns did improve quite a lot, however, in the 19th century, and so a generation or two later, they got to work. On this trip, I have seen several tourists with really hideously burned backs of necks, and I've been very glad of my high-necked shirts. I don't think it's Roman. I think it's Phoenician. Here you can see two distinct lines of defence, one above the other, following the natural ridges in the rock. The guns they were using were at first rifled muzzle loaders, but then later they had fast-firing breech loaders. And when they had the Maxim gun later on, they had machine gun nests as well. I think they're out there. They're not. So yes, it was 1798 that the, the, the Napoleon the Git landed on Malta, and then he went off to Egypt, uh, trying to bring misery to as many people as well, and death to as many people as he could, and he succeeded there fairly impressively, I have to say. Uh, but his plans for world in miser in miserament uh, were scotched by Sir Sidney Smith. Uh, and I've made a video about him that you might want to have a look at because a lot of people have been quite nice about that one. And another chap called Horatio Nelson who uh, fought the Battle of the Nile and ha ha destroyed the French fleet uh, largely in the Nile and uh, so yes, Scotch Napoleon's plans there. A quick whiz along the lines now and you can see how the walls follow the lie of the land closely and how there are artillery batteries, infantry blockhouses and electric searchlights dotted along the walls. Fortified bridges spanned the steep clefts in the escarpment. New imported materials like Portland cement and steel plating and girders contributed to the defences. OK, so that's what the Victoria Line was. It was a line of fortifications across the island, but this still doesn't really uh, explain how it all works. Because I've just said that if you land a really big invading force that massively outnumbers the defenders, uh, uh, then you're likely to win in, in the end, aren't you? And surely the British should be afraid of that. And well, they, they, they sort of were, but they, they, they got a plan, you see. They thought, right, if we just use a, a regiment or two to hold this line and just let the enemy land, well, all we've got to do is delay them for a bit because, you see, we're British and we're different from Johnny Foreigner because when uh, some man from whatever regiment his, his job it is to uh, defend the Victoria Line is doing his job, he does so knowing that in this world there is this thing known as the Royal Navy. And the Royal Navy is not like other navies. And it really wasn't. In terms of how powerful it was relative to other uh, navies, there's nothing around now. Or th th it, it was pretty much unique in history. It was so powerful. Uh, in fact, it was in uh, 1889 that, uh, that the British came up with the so-called two-power standard, uh, but they were pretty much achieving that before anyway. Um, in the Napoleonic era, Nelson and all that, the, the Royal Navy was not just big, it was seriously good. It was, it was very consistently beating anyone it came across. The Royal Navy was not just big, it was really, really good. And by uh, 1889, they had a two-power standard, and which meant that by policy, they would maintain, in, in peacetime this is, not just during a war, even in peacetime, they would maintain at all times a navy that could confidently beat not just the next biggest navy in the world, but the next two biggest navies in the world combined, which they saw as something of a worst case scenario. They could do this. So, defending the Victoria Line, all you had to do was hold out for long enough for the Royal Navy to show up. And then the Royal Navy would show up with an awful lot of really big guns that could pound. Uh, and, and you're never far from the sea with Malta, because it's quite small. So they could just pound any invading army's camps to dust and then land wherever they wanted, really. They could, of course, land troops in, in Valletta and in Marsha Schlock, uh, because the guns there wouldn't fire at them, and so the Royal Navy could just sail in there and land any number of troops and supplies necessary uh, to see off any defender who was stupid enough to try to attack Malta. Yeah, the, you see, they'll, they'll come up to the Victoria Line, the oh, cliffs and all oh, were being shot at, and it uh, would delay, and then the Royal Navy shows that it's all over. You see, this is bound to work. 
And did it work? Well, yes, it definitely did. And yet it also sort of didn't. It definitely did work in that nobody ever tried attacking Malta. There are loads of people who would have liked to, but nobody ever gave it a go. Whoops! I should have said in this period. Yes, eventually, of course, in World War II, the Italians and Germans would attack the island. But they were using aircraft, which somewhat changed the equation. But no one attacked it in a century and a half. And I don't think it's fair to blame people in the middle of the Victorian period for not designing fortifications that work against weapons that hadn't been invented yet. But that really is the greatest sign of, of a good defence. If you've got fortifications that no one will ever attempt attacking because they just the, the task just looks too flipping daunting, well then those fortifications have done a perfect job. If your fortifications aren't quite so good, however, someone might try and fail, that's that's still that, you know it's still worth having fortifications, but that's not as good. You want people not even to try. Um, and in 1888, there was a report uh, that uh, deemed the defences having been inspected, uh, they were very very strong and sound, fit for purpose. So this report said. Um, had there were, however, a number of army manoeuvres being carried out by the British, mock battles, if you like, training the troops, that sort of thing, and testing the defences. Uh, and in a couple of these, um, quite substantial numbers of, of mock attacking troops were able to get round the western end, largely unobserved by most of the defending guns because of the lie of the land. And it, well, it, <clears throat> yeah, it wasn't perfect there, but it, but but nobody tried to attack uh, the, the Victoria lines. So there you go, they worked. So that's one way you can defend an island if you just happen to have a stupendously powerful navy. Um, Bye. Did